Thank you, Liz, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. President, and uh, for inviting Joe and I here and uh, giving us the opportunity to share a little of our story and what we've learnt about stress and, and trying to build some resilience in our lives. And I guess, you know, we all face stress, obviously. Um, on the farm, we seem to, to have uh, plenty of that, dealing with the weather and animals and people. But nothing really prepared us for the 8th of July 2010 when I got a phone call from Ewan, our son-in-law, very distressed, saying, you know, you better get out to the farm. Something's happened to Scott. You know, we um, don't live on the farm. We're about 10 minutes away. So Joe had been out that morning. She was away when they got the phone call. She was out swimming at the local swimming pool. And um, I, uh, we'd just actually been on a business course a few days earlier, and, and a guy talked to us about resilience. And one of the things I remember he said was to slow down your breathing, you know, in times of stress. So I was, I nearly panicked and uh, took off out the house and left the doors open and the lights on. But I'm driving out to the farm, I kept saying to myself, slow down, you know, slow down the breathing, slow down the breathing. Don't, don't, uh, don't panic and trying to think, you know, what was I going to find? What was I, you know, what to expect? Went to where I thought, the guys on the farm would be found no one, so then drove up the road towards Scott's house and um, there on the side of the road Ewan was sitting on the motorbike, very distressed and said that uh, somebody had killed Scott. And to start with I was, you know, before I got to that stage I was thinking, you know, do we need ambulance, uh, paramedics, you know, what do we need? And funny things go through the mind, but the first thing I thought, well, we don't have to worry about calling an ambulance. But um, I drove, I didn't stop there long, just drove straight up to Scott's house and parked behind a police car that was already there. And uh, I hopped out and the policewoman walked towards me with a rifle and said, stay where you are. And uh, so that focused my attention pretty quickly. <laughs> and uh, fortunately a neighbour was there at the scene as well and he obviously told her who I was. So I was able to um, then approach her and uh, I could see Scott lying on his driveway. I, I couldn't see all of him because of the rail fence um, obscured some of my view, but he was about 30 metres away from me. And all I want to do is, you know, go up and give him a hug. And uh, of course they wouldn't let me go near Scott and uh, obviously to realise afterwards so you don't, um, you know, destroy anything at the scene of the crime. But um, so then I said, well, you know, who's with Kylie? Scott's seven month pregnant wife in the house with their two year old boy and they said no one's with her and I thought crumbs that's not good so I uh, took a bit to convince them that I could go into the house so I had to climb, couldn't go up the driveway obviously so I had to climb a couple of fences and get into the house and when, they said when you get there you know you can't come out you'll have to stay there until we tell you it's okay to come out so when I got to the house I don't think Kylie really knew that Scott was dead at that stage she saw the police at the drive at the gateway and uh, she said you know is somebody helping Scott who's helping Scott and I had to tell her that he, he was beyond help and he was dead and that was pretty hard and then trying to console her and then even more difficult was to ring Joe and and say that there'd been a tragedy and um, and our son was killed and I had to say worse than that that we think he's been murdered so that was pretty tough and we were in the house for another two or three hours before the police were able to come and say, you know, we can get out. So we had to get Kylie, as I say, seven months pregnant, up over the couple of rail fences out to the road and down to Anna's place, just down the road a bit. And by then, of course, a lot of family had arrived and a lot of tears. Everybody was pretty morbid. Um, there wasn't much we could do. There was so much we didn't know and so many questions that we had racing around in our minds. The farm still had to keep running. Um, I started to think about what needed to be done. We had the vet coming that morning to pregnancy test some cows. The milk tanker was due and the police had put up some roadblocks. So I had to ring the dairy company and try and explain them what to do to get into the farm. Uh, we had a busload of visitors that were supposed to be coming and put them off. And, um, wages, I had to pay the wages that day because I worked out everybody's hours and paid their wages. So, But it was a, quite a good distraction for me and I've got an office at the farm so I sort of took a bit of solace just getting on my own and um, of course the cows had to be milked that night. So 
that happened, you know, carried on for that day. But the next day really began the string of events that became so public with, um, you know, immediately that following day, I did seven hours with a police interview uh, at home, fortunately, but um, that was one of many, many hours of interviews that we did. We had dozens and dozens of people calling in and, and to see us and giving us food and flowers and condolences. We had the media knocking on the door, wanting to know what was going on. And um, in those first few days, oh, trying to organise a funeral, of course. Um, and then we had Kylie and her mother and two sisters and, and Hunter, the, 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 our grandson. Um, shift in with us as well, and we didn't really know. I mean, we knew Kylie reasonably well. Scott and her had been married about five years, but we certainly didn't uh, know her mother and two sisters that well. And so, you know, none of us were sleeping well. You'd get up in the middle of the night and have a chat with somebody else that was unable to sleep and you couldn't eat very well. You only could eat quite bland food, and we were kept, get, kept being given a heap of food that really we had to give away ourselves. Um, so... We got through that first week, and then about six weeks later, my dad, he was very close to Scott. He was in his 80s, about eight, coming up 85, I think, 84. And he was getting quite depressed. He was quite an extrovert sort of a man. He loved people, and we'd never seen him like this before, and he, he said he was depressed. And um, my mum, she's fairly blunt, you know, she'd say to him, well, you know, pull yourself together, get, you know, get, on, get, out, get out of, got to get out of that mindset. Well, that doesn't work, I tell you. Um, but um, we had a couple of two or three trips in the ambulance to the hospital, A and E. We he had a couple of minor heart attacks, and finally, as they, after six weeks, they discovered that he had pancreatic cancer. And I'm sure that he probably, you know, had it for quite a long time without knowing. But the stress of and the trauma of going through the, the murder of Scott certainly brought it on, and so. For the next six weeks, we, we watched him fade away and, and finally pass away. But a couple of weeks after that, he was diagnosed. Kylie was due to have Drover, the next uh, son. Now, Scott had bought a pocket knife. He, he, had a, he was a real cowboy because he'd spent a year in the Aussie outback, and he had a pocket knife that he bought specially to cut the cord of Hunter, the older boy, and he bought another pocket knife to cut the cord of Drover and um, he was anticipating being doing it again. And, and because he wasn't there, Kylie, which really surprised me, said, would I stand in for, for Scott? So that was quite an emotional day for all of us. It was, it was quite civilised and planned because it, she had a planned caesarean. So um, I was there in the theatre once she had taken Drover from the womb and put him in the corner. They actually already had cut the cord, but it was a bit longer, so I just did the ceremony. <laughs> um, the, uh, they had him on a, a table in the corner of the theatre and he wasn't breathing. And uh, I could see the doctors and nurses, you know, they're looking fairly concerned. I thought, well, they know what they're doing. Um, and uh, I guess, and so one of the nurses said to me, you know, talk to him. They respond to voices, talk to him, rub his legs. So I started doing that and said to Drover, you know, we really need you here, boy. And, uh, you know, you're very special to us. And uh, anyway, it seemed like a long time, but it was probably only a matter of seconds. And he took a huge breath and turned from grey to, to pink and um, so it was you know it was a real privilege to be able to watch my grandson take his first breath and then uh, within a few weeks dad take his final breath and I was with him the night he died and um, sitting there with him uh, well, I stayed the last couple of nights with him and um, and I just woke up in the middle of the night by chance really I guess maybe sort of someone, someone else waking me up and uh, and saw him take a big deep breath and, and he passed away. So we screwed the lid on Dad's coffin, we'd screwed the lid on Scott's, wrote a few messages on the inside before we did it, and which is something that you think, well I've never thought I would do anything like that, but it, for me it was quite a, quite a good thing and um, you know, closing of a chapter I guess if you like. And we thought, well you know, it can't get any worse now, and of course it did. And, um, Nine months after Scott was killed, as you know, Ewan was arrested, our son-in-law. Ewan was arrested for the murder. And uh, that was a real kick in the guts for us, obviously. And then a month after that, our nephew was murdered in Perth. And Joe's, this is Joe's sister's 
boy and Joe and her sister were soulmates and she was a big support to us and suddenly that support was taken away and the roles reversed and unfortunately the, the trial of, of um, the guy that murdered Andy started in Perth exactly the same week that the trial started in, well, here in Wellington for us so they were, you know, we were unable to support each other through that period. The, um, so coping with all of this um, we had some very, very good help. A guy by the name, some of you may know David Irving from Auckland, and he, we'd known David for a little while, and he said, you know, anything I can do to help. And he helped us identify a lot of the issues because there's so much going through your mind, you know, we couldn't see the wood for the trees. And so David said to us, Joe and Nikki, our elder daughter, have got a clothes shop. He said, you know, we've really got to deal with that, close that down, because they weren't able to spend the time in the shop, and it was just going backwards. So. We got to the stage where we closed the shop. I needed to get a, a new farm manager employed so that I didn't have to be thinking about the day-to-day -day operations. He said, you guys need a holiday. We hadn't really thought about that. In fact, there was a lot of stress. This is middle of 2011, I guess, and I was coming out with boils on my head. It was pretty bad. I had them. It felt like somebody drilling a hole in the top of my head, and I had one on my forehead. So we took off for three or four weeks overseas. It wasn't until we got past Singapore that people stopped recognising us and t talking to us about everything. And uh, we had a great few weeks um, in France where we just were able to relax and, and take stock of things. The other thing he said, you've really got to get prepared for the trial. So six months out for the trial, get mentally prepared. Um, but also we came down to Wellington. One of the really good bits of advice was to go into the courtroom and see what it was like. We talked to the court, you know, well before the trial started. We talked to the court staff, they told us the procedures and how things worked, and it was very, very helpful rather than coming in cold. And, um, and also David was very concerned about the media attention that he thought would uh, eventuate, which of course it did, and he said, you've got to get some advice on how to talk to the media or how to handle them and, and what to do. So we took that advice as well. But um, the trial was very stressful for us. We, um, particularly the waiting, I guess, but walking, what the prosecutor did, he said to us, we're going to tell a story to the jury in chapters. So there's a chapter on um, the day of, that Scott was killed. There's a chapter on the family relationships. There's a chapter on the farm business and so on and so on. So there's about a dozen chapters. But what that meant was that instead of just going in and giving our evidence once, particularly Anna and I went in, a, I did nine times to walk that gauntlet in through the, past the public gallery. You've got Ewan, the accused, sitting on the right-hand side as you walk through the doors. On the left, there's a dozen or more reporters, all with their laptops, um, writing about what's going on. Um, past the defence and the prosecution bench and the jury on the right, and then there's cameras clicking at you, too cameras with lenses that long, um, or felt like in our faces, but of course they weren't, but clicking flat out, plus a TV camera going the whole time, recording every uh, extortion of your face with the emotion that went on. So that was quite stressful to do that, but it's, it's a waiting, you know, you build up, they'd say, well, we want you to be here about 11 o'clock, ready to go in at 11, oh no, well the previous witness is taking a bit longer, there's more questions from the defence, so we have you after lunch now, you know, so you go down. And then they build you up, and this went on for four weeks. And um, we had to, we learned quite quickly to make ourselves eat, um, you know, morning tea time. You didn't feel like eating anything, but you had to, even if it was just a muesli bar, to get something in and get the brain, um, you know, sugar levels up and a bit of brain food. And so that was very important. But with resilience, um, I think no matter, you know, whether it's your personal life or, or business, I think a lot of it is about building relationships and building relationships before things become a, an issue or before it gets, uh, you know, you reach those traumas, which are going to happen. I mean, that, we can't avoid that. And, you know, building relationships with our staff, with our customers, our suppliers, our children and parents or uh, partners and spouses. Uh, you know, I was a terrible terrible husband. We've been married coming up, well, not quite 40 years, but I was a shocker, really, the first, especially the first half. And we've written this book, 
with Tony Farrington, and uh, I won't go into it now, but chapter two talks a lot about it, and uh, you know, it doesn't make me look very good, I can tell you. Um, <laughs> because I didn't talk, I was hopeless. And, and I guess a lot of it is, you know, you've got a young family, you're trying to build a career, you're trying to support a young family, and there's so much pressure on us, and we take on other community roles as well, and um, yeah, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't good. So talking about things is, is so critical, and I think men particularly, and probably New Zealand men, we're, we're must be the worst at talking about things that actually do matter. Um, so I think that's so important. Also, um, having good people around us, and like I say with, with Tony Farrington, uh, not Tony, uh, sorry, David Irving, um, having people around you to, to give a, a good advice is, is such an important thing. Um, having a purpose, you know, for us, in some ways we were very fortunate because we had the farm for one thing, to have to keep running, but also our children and grandchildren. You know, that has given us such a focus. We've got six grandchildren who didn't have fathers in their lives and still still don't. Um, and so it's such a, a, a focus and a purpose to make us get out of bed in the morning and, and think about them. And that certainly builds some re resilience in us. And the other big thing is the community. Um, you know, I wear this silver fern, and it's not because I love the All Blacks, or which I do, but it's not for the All Blacks or the the um, yachting or the rugby league. Did not say Phoenix did I today because they didn't do well. But it's it, you know, it's a, it's a symbol of pride and inspiration in New Zealand, the silver fern. But for me, it, it I wear it almost always when I've got a suit or a jacket on because I'm so proud to be a New Zealander and so proud of the people that have helped us around the country. You know, we've had hundreds and hundreds of people support us and it's been quite phenomenal. So with that, have I got time? There's just one time for one little more story, um, which is not in the book. Our daughter Nikki, our oldest daughter Nikki, was married last year and, and in August, late August, she, um, she had a baby and we knew, she knew that before this baby was born, she knew that it had a, a serious heart problem and was going to need an operation. So she had the baby up in Auckland, up in Starship, and the plan was after four or five days they would do an operation. I mean, it's incredible, really, the, the skill of, of the doctors that they can do this on a four or five day old baby, and they do, you know, regularly. But unfortunately, they, they couldn't do it, and they found that if, after a few days more, they found that she had a rare lung disease, of all things, that hardly anybody ever got. And so it was unable to be operated on, and, and the, she was all wired up to life support, of course. So they said to Nikki and James, you know, you've got to decide which day we're going to turn this off. And so after two weeks, we were up there, up and back quite a bit, and after two weeks, we, they, they turned off the machines. And the last couple of days was quite good because they were able to pick her up and hold her, because for the first 10 days, really, they, you know, they just had to they could touch her but they couldn't pick her up so it was quite hard for them and they're still struggling I mean they, they're not going to get over it but they're going to have to learn to um, to cope and uh, with this as well and so um, little Elsie died about seven hours after the life support was turned off which is about six and a half more than they thought but it was great you know I mean it's it's a bizarre lot of events that we've been through but to be able to hold that little baby in our arms before she died well before she died and after she died and uh, I can still feel her, you know, holding that limp little body. She looked perfect on the outside, but I could feel my heart pumping against her little body. And, uh, you know, then we laid her in the casket a few days later. And Well, we didn't lie in the casket, but we would put the lid on her casket a few days later. And I thought we'd been through a lot of grief and different types of grief, but that going through losing Elsie taught us so much more about what grief is and what love is and um, you know in a very strange sort of way we are just so much richer for all these experiences that we've been through and to, you know the opportunities that we've since been given and the, the people that we've come across as I said that have helped us it really does um, it's a bizarre turn of events and uh, you know we wouldn't be here talking to you today if, if it wasn't for what we've been through so in a strange sort of way, we are very, very rich for that experience. So thank you very much for hearing some of our story.
I guess um, when <laughs> Joe's, Joe's saying no, um, I mean justice and truth, two different things I think. So, so the justice system works, and what we went through worked because you, you know, we we didn't see all the evidence that was presented in court, but the you know, and the only ones that did, of course, uh, are, the, are the jury, and and so the system works. But um, well, as best it can. I mean, what's better? That's the problem, isn't it? I mean, got anything that's any better but to get the truth out I think is is a different thing and so we haven't necessarily got the truth of what might have happened but we have been through a justice system that is as good as we we've got really yeah absolutely and we identified very early on that this was either going to bring us together or, or rip us apart and we were determined that we wanted our family to stay together um, it, w it was probably one of the most important things to us, and um, we've read a lot of self-help books and uh, over the years, and um, you know, been to to different courses, I suppose, for self-improvement. And so um, there were a lot of things that we'd read about, and we had theories on, and thought, well, you know, now we've got to put it into practice. And a lot of a lot of um, we get a lot of inspiration from those books and from other people. You know, pe things that people have said. You know. Martin Luther King talked about, I'm going to, uh, um, what did he say, I'm going to uh, carve a tunnel of hope through this mountain of despair. You know, things like that that just sort of come up. I mean, we've got a, quite a strong faith as well. And uh, we put uh, little Bible verses on the bathroom mirror and read those to, you know, ourselves each day. So, but, but for a while there, I mean, Joe, she would write journals and that's what a lot of the books about really is something from her journals that I never read I still haven't read to this day uh, she'd tell me bits out of it so she found I guess some comfort in writing I'd get out on the farm and do things but I mean the sex went long you know straight away there was no <laughs> no no sex for a good while <laughs> but you know that's what it's like I mean you, you, you just it, it's not an important part of a relationship in those Day, early days of trauma, I mean, you know, and shock. It's uh, it's talking with each other and spending a lot of time talking. I must say this: we, it's not like that now. Won't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, too much information. <laughs> too much information <laughs> but, but you know, that's the way it is when you're in shock. These are the things that drive you apart. But our relationship now is stronger than it's ever been. And um, we are so grateful for other people that have helped us to, to get that. It hasn't been on our own, I can tell you.